On the night of September 9, 1903, Fred Rohrer, editor of the temperance paper The Burn Witness, settled peacefully into bed, tucked away on the second floor of his house with his wife and children. It had been a long day. Rohr had spent the afternoon in Decatur, Indiana, appealing to the Decatur's commissioner's courts to deny liquor licenses to potential saloon owners in Bern. He had spent the entire summer biking back and forth between Bern and Decatur, making the 24-mile round trip for the temperance cause. That night, shortly after the clock struck midnight, Rohrer's wife, Emma, awoke to a scratching noise coming from the first floor of the house. She rose from bed to investigate, and finding nothing out of the ordinary, she made her way back upstairs. Surely it was her imagination, she thought to herself. Twenty minutes later, however, Rohrer awoke to two heavy explosions in his home. As Rohrer and his family slept on the second floor, someone slipped one stick of dynamite through a downstairs window, and another under his front porch. But this attack was no surprise. Fred Rohrer had been a target since the conception of his newspaper in 1896. I'm Justin Clark, and this is Talking Hoosier History. In the early 19th century, Indiana and other states across the Midwest saw the arrival of Mennonites, who immigrated from northeast Switzerland and Germany. Their religious beliefs stemmed from the Anabaptist movement, whose roots could be traced back to the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. A range of societal, political, and economic changes prompted their exodus from the homeland, such as the Napoleonic Wars, poor harvests, and mandatory military service. As more Mennonite families praised the religious and social freedoms on the American frontier to their families back home, extended kin soon followed. The network of chain migration resulted in the creation of small, German-speaking settlements across the Midwest landscape, as Swiss Mennonites made the U.S. their new home. This was the case for 16-year-old Fred Rohrer, who emigrated from Bern, Switzerland to Sonneberg, Ohio in the spring of 1883 with his parents and 13 siblings. Three years later, the Rohrer family made their way to Bern, Indiana, named after their original hometown. Incorporated in 1887, a year after the Rohrer's arrival, the family arrived at a pivotal time in the town's history. Rumblings of the temperance movement gripped the leaders of the freshly established city. As many secular organizations linked alcohol consumption to moral and economic problems of the time, the push to abolish alcohol began to influence religious and political ideologies in the United States. Methodist groups served as the bedrock of early temperance activism, and soon more religious groups followed. The first major temperance group in Indiana appeared in 1826 with the formation of the American Temperance Society. However, it was not until 1828 that activism surrounding temperance intensified in the state. Between 1830 and 1850, temperance organizers helped pass nearly 125 laws throughout the state that bolstered temperance by regulating liquor prices and the amount sold. Beliefs of piety, self-restraint, and morality connected Mennonites to the temperance movement. Drunkenness coincided with sex work and gambling, all sins originating in the saloon, they contended. And all these issues resonated with Fred Rohrer. His religious beliefs quickly spurred him to join the fight against liquor consumption. A key component to that was his establishment of the Burn Witness newspaper in 1896. After purchasing an old Washington hand press and equipment from the Decatur Press and Decatur Democrat offices, Rohrer published his first issue on September 3rd. He wrote to his readers, The intent of this paper is to make people happy. Happiness is a duty of men. It is next to godliness and cleanliness. Soon recognized as a temperance paper, the Burn Witness began as a weekly, garnering circulation of about 700 by the turn of the century as the city boasted a population of just a little over 1,000 individuals. That same year, Rohrer incorporated a supplement to the witness in the German language, reflecting the steady growth of the Mennonite population. While Bern's status as a respectable Hoosier town grew, the discovery of oil just a few miles outside of Bern city limits in 1902 threatened the population's solitude. Transient, single, working-class men, alongside prominent oil men seeking a fortune, flooded the local population. As a result, concerns over vice-related activities like drinking, gambling, and sex work skyrocketed. 
Many prominent Bern leaders believe this was the perfect opportunity to enforce liquor laws before the town and its problems became any bigger. As a leading supporter of prohibition, as well as an active voice within the Christian Temperance Society of Bern, CTSB, Rohrer's role in establishing the city as a dry town is highlighted in the Bern Witness. Tales of his protests, his successes and failures, and his dedication to upholding his religious beliefs are woven throughout nearly 20 years of publication. His influence in the CTSB allowed Rohrer to use his paper to establish a fluid connection between temperance activists and the larger community. Rohrer and The Witness played a crucial role in converting Bern into a dry town. It frequently reported updates on local women's Christian temperance unions meetings, changes in Indiana's liquor laws and liquor license requirements, and even grassroots efforts on getting the city to become dry. In September of 1904, the Burn Witness posted a notice on a local anti-saloon day, while boasting to its readers regarding the success that temperance leaders had in ridding their town of alcohol. Next Sunday will be another anti-saloon day in Burn, the paper read. Reverend John F. Lewis, one of the field secretaries of the Indiana Anti-Saloon League, will be here to speak at the Evangelical Church in the morning and at the Mennonite Church in the evening. This is the first summer that Byrne has been without a legalized saloon, and even the saloon advocates admit and proclaim that it has been the most prosperous in the history of Byrne. More importantly, the Byrne Witness became a weapon that enabled Rohrer to call out local authorities and saloon owners for their illegal activities. As his paper grew in popularity and readership, Rohrer became a local legend, but his fame also made him the main target for retaliation. In September 1902, Rohrer met with several other men to discuss the enforcement of the local option provision brought on by the state's Nicholson Law. The law required a two-year waiting period between liquor license applications and their issuance. Additionally, the law allowed for remonstrances, or public votes and petitions, for the denial of any liquor license. The CTSB was quick to form petitions against every saloon in Bern. Rohrer, also a member of Indiana's Anti-Saloon League, commented on the remonstrances in The Witness in 1902, saying that Christian patriotic forces in America were attempting to solve the saloon question by eradicating saloons altogether. The saloon must go, he wrote. Remonstrances have been circulated and a great majority of the names of voters have been secured. Initially, these remonstrances were successful. The witness reported on December 5th that two saloons, one owned by Jacob Brenneman and the other by Jacob Hunsicker, officially closed, with another to cease in March of 1903. However, the celebration of these closures prompted complaints from others. Though the Byrne witness gave Rohrer unfettered access to disseminating his opinion, it also opened the door to violent retribution by saloon owners and liquor drinkers. By the start of 1903, tensions escalated between saloon owners and Rohrer, Early in January, Rohrer posted a notice on the front page of The Witness, incentivizing the community through monetary payment to report liquor violations and sign their public petitions. This plan, however, failed, and remonstrances were ignored. The Board of Commissioners approved liquor licenses for several men across town, directly violating the Nicholson Law. The CTSB complained to city officials, but they were forced to take their grievances to the circuit court in Decatur, Indiana. Rohrer spent the summer of 1903 biking 10 miles to bring Burn locals' petitions to court. However, Rohrer experienced little success. On June 4th, the Democrat newspaper claimed that the city of Burn, despite protests, was still wet, as the commissioner's court granted a license to John Reinecker to operate a saloon in town. Rohrer's remonstrance against Reinecker had been declared insufficient due to his lack of an attorney. A month later, the Democrat claimed that Rohrer was still busy in the auditor's office, where he filed remonstrances containing 396 local signatures against the granting of license to sell liquors to J.M. Ersham, William Sheets, and Samuel L. Kuntz. Tensions between Rohrer, Burn saloon owners, and local anti-temperance supporters peaked by September. In the middle of the night on September 10th, someone managed to slip dynamite into the first level of Rohrer's home, under his porch. Despite no one being harmed, the explosions destroyed half of the structure. Rohrer described the wreckage in the burn witness a few days later. 
We looked out the windows in the kitchen and dining room and then came into the sitting room, just beneath the bedroom we were all sleeping in. The moon was shining in through a large hole in the wall where the front door used to be and through two other large holes where windows were missing. A few shreds of the curtains left hanging from the top were wafted in by the south wind and made a spectral noise, and together with the debris of broken pieces of glass and dishes and furniture lying topsy-turvy gave the room a ghastly appearance. Local carpenters were quick to start repairs on Rohrer's home the following morning. News of the attack spread across the Midwest, with articles on the murder attempt appearing in the Indianapolis News, the Kentucky Post, and even the Salt Lake Herald. But many, especially Rohrer, were not surprised. He wrote in the Burn Witness, As had been stated in Friday's issue and in other papers, the attack was not unexpected to us. Every night as we went to bed last week, I told my wife to be prepared for almost anything. It was later reported that the special grand jury tasked with investigating the incident failed to bring any indictments in the case, and no one was charged. Women within the CTSB began surveilling Rohrer's home shortly after the attack. The Plymouth Tribune reported that five women, armed with their husbands' revolvers, kept guard to ensure that Rohrer could rest peacefully. In fact, their continued support encouraged him to move forward with his work. Threats of violence and death to his family would not halt Rohrer's dedication to the temperance cause. He told his readers in The Burned Witness several days later, The result of the week's worth is, one saloon is closed, and the liquor element preached such a powerful temperance servant that its effect is worth more than a hundred times the cost. Who says God is not in this movement? Have more faith in God and less fear of men and be ready to make a sacrifice for a good cause, and the liquor traffic in Bern will surely die. On September 11th, the morning after the bombing, Rohr biked back to Decatur to approach the commissioner's court with a remonstrance against Joseph Hocker, a Monroe resident who was seeking to apply for a liquor license in Bern. The Byrne witness stated that Rohrer also brought 33 cases of law violations to a grand jury against Byrne saloon keepers, claiming that the attack in his house was very naturally connected with the saloon fight in town. The grand jury convened and handed down six indictments, and saloon keepers had to pay a minimum fine. On November 18th, 60 suspected patrons of Byrne saloons received subpoenas to appear before the court to testify. Enraged by the indictment, a mob targeting Rohrer formed the following day. First, resident Louis Sprunger approached Rohrer in the Burn Witness offices, challenging him to a fight out on the street, which Rohrer refused. Later that evening, Sprunger followed him into the post office, where Sprunger attacked him. Two female workers came to Rohrer's defense, tackling Sprunger and forcing the man to leave. After retreating to the safety of the witness offices, the president of the town council, Abe Bogley, attempted to drag Rohr out but failed to get him on the street. Instead, Bogley decided to give Rohr a beating until the local marshal arrived at the scene to break up the fight. As Rohr was taken to safety, a mob, consisting of saloon keepers and other locals, gathered noisily outside of the witness offices to determine the extent of Bogley's assault. The Indianapolis News covered the incident and stated that Rohr was advised by the local sheriff to temporarily leave Burn out of fear of more violence. He found asylum in Decatur, where he released a statement that he proposes to continue the fight against the saloon until his enemies kill him. Rohr did not return home until a week later, and on December 4th, the Kansas Prohibitionist reported that Rohr began arming his home and offices with revolvers and shotguns. His wife, who refused to leave her husband's side, began practicing with the weapons to protect the home. The increased violence in the town, however, forced saloon keepers to come to a compromise with Rohrer and the CTSB. On December 18th, the Burn Witness reported that John Ranke, J.M. Ersham, and Samuel L. Kuntz offered a compromise. The saloon keepers would go out of business on April 1st, 1904, provided they were dismissed on paying the costs of their current indictment charges. As compromises were deliberated, Rohr released another statement on Christmas Eve, declaring that he would not concede despite his friends fearing that he would be murdered. It was clear that Rohr would not back down, no matter how much violent saloon keepers and liquor supporters inflicted on him. On December 29th, the Indianapolis Journal reported that, after one of the bitterest anti-saloon battles in the history of the state, 
Saloon owners Ranke, Ursham, and Kuntz agreed to close their doors on the grounds that within a few days, Rohrer would drop his cases against the men regarding various liquor violations. As the city of Bern approached the new year, it seemed that the liquor fight was finally coming to a peaceful end. Ultimately, 1903 proved to be the most defining year for Rohrer's activism and for the temperance battle in the city of Bern. Over the next three years, Rohrer and The Witness reported the continued forced closures of Bern saloons and liquor law violators. However, the election of Governor James Franklin Hanley, a staunch supporter of Prohibition, in 1904 brought an end to the violence that accompanied Rohrer's fight. Governor Hanley's involvement in the temperance movement solidified the ban of alcohol at the highest state level with the Moore Amendment, which enacted a county option law regarding the ban of alcoholic beverages. The local liquor fight officially ended in 1907, when the city rejoiced over the last quantities of alcohol being carried into the street and drained. Bern was officially a dry town and remained that way until the repeal of the 18th Amendment in 1932. Want to learn more about Fred Rohrer and the Burn Witness? Check out our blog post, The Saloon Must Go, Fred Rohrer, the Burn Witness, and the Fight for Temperance in Burn, Indiana, by IHB historian Emily McGuire. Historical markers are also a great way to learn about Indiana's publishing history, such as our marker on the demise of German newspapers in Indiana. German-language newspapers thrived as Germans became Indiana's largest immigrant population by 1850. The Taglicher Telegraph and Tribuna in Indianapolis was among over 175 German-language newspapers published in Indiana from 1843 to 1920. These newspapers were important vehicles for readers in integrating and maintaining their cultural identities with American values. However, U.S. entry into World War I in 1917 created suspicion and antipathy toward German-American schools, churches, clubs, and newspapers. Several of these Indiana newspapers, which had tried to present balanced war coverage, closed by 1918. This included the Tag Liquor Telegraph and Tribune and papers in Bern, South Bend, Logansport, Evansville, and Terre Haute. You can learn more about this marker and many others at our website, in.gov forward slash history. This episode was written by Emily McGuire and produced by A.J. Shraplevy. Find a transcript and show notes for this and all our episodes at podcast.history.in.gov. And remember to subscribe, rate, and review Talking Hoosier History wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, I'm Justin Clark, and this has been Talking Hoosier History. Thanks for listening. <laughs>